Hello everyone, thank you for joining me today. Um, I have a very good guest today. I hope you can hear me all well. Um, today I will have a special guest, I'll introduce him to you in a minute. I'm just waiting for everyone to join in and share the program, which I am doing myself. Um, I think I'll share it on Facebook as well and then invite my guest to talk about Hizmet movement, uh, membership issues and also the diversity within the Hizmet movement. My guest is Behzad Fatimi from India. He is a, a YouTuber, a commentator, uh, also he is a Hizmet member as well. But I will tell him, tell it more about him. It's just everything has been updated, so I'm not sure whether it is all working. If you can confirm that you can hear the sound and the the video quality is good. Okay. I think for some reason there is some sort of a delay. I'm trying to declunk, make sure everything is closed down so I have a better uh, power. S for some reason it is not as smooth as I would expect it to be. Anyway, if the weavers are okay, if you can hear and see everything correctly, uh, I would like to invite you, uh, I would like to introduce you to Mr. Besat Fatimi, I will. I want to give a, a few a bit of information about him. You can see, as you see, he's a regular writer on various t uh, news outlets. One of them is Hindustan Times. He writes about Turkey mostly, and his met movement. And this one is just after the coup attempt, and uh, one of his articles. He also writes about Erdogan, and of course Turkey and his met movement. I already said that. And then one other thing, he's got a YouTube channel with 500 plus subscribers. Um, there is often uh, English and Urdu content in here, a good quality, well thought, well articulated content. Uh, I would like you to subscribe to his channel as well. It's very easy. You can find him as if you search as M. Behzad Fatmi, you can find him. And he's also a research fellow and, you know, a regular commentator on various TV channels, mostly in India. Uh, without further ado, I would like to take him on screen. Let me see whether it works. Mr. Behzad Fatimi, welcome to my channel. How are you doing? Thank you so much. It's a pleasure uh, being with you. I'm fine. How are you? Yeah, you have actually witnessed how I prepare this program, how I, you know, prepare everything for the program. It is it is a difficult situation. Uh, one reason you are, you have witnessed, apart from other guests, because they are guests, and I'm hoping that we'll be having this program co-host together and talking various issues. But I'm assuming because this is my YouTube channel, my uh, less known YouTube channel with less followers. Maybe many people that doesn't know m about you, so they they may know me. So let's uh, let's start talking about you first, if if that is okay. Who is Besat Fatimi? Right. So uh, um, I'm Besat Fatimi, as you just said, uh, and uh, I am an Indian. I was uh, born in 1991 uh, in an, in the eastern state of Bihar in India. And uh, after completing my uh, 10th grade, I moved to the capital of, of India, New Delhi, where I completed my uh, further education. I also took my undergraduate degree from a, a university in New Delhi. And uh, I, uh, in 2012, as I completed my, uh, as I received my undergraduate degree, I moved to Turkey. Uh, there, I uh, learned the Turkish language and I then worked here in Mevlana University, Konya. 
Uh, and uh, so in total, I lived uh, in Turkey for about three years. And uh, after that, I moved to the UK for my master's. I received my master's degree in Keele University from Keele University in uh, uh, dialogue studies. And uh, since 2016, I'm back in India and I'm now uh, working at, at in Dialogue Foundation, visit, which is Hizmet Movement's dialogue organization in India. Okay, that's a very brief introduction. I personally met you whilst you were studying your degree at Keele University in UK. And since then, we have been in touch. I, I was a host for you. I, I was a guest for you a couple of weeks ago for your master's degree or, or your degree in, in, in dialogue. And uh, I met with uh, Gandhi's uh, granddaughter. She was... Grandson. Sorry? Grandson. Yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I think you are doing programs together. Uh, that's a very brief introduction, mm -hmm. but one side, you are not only working for in dialogue, you also would define yourself as a Hizmet Movement member. That's a very rare to find. How do you, how, how, when did you and how did you met with Hizmet Movement? How did you become a member? Did you get uh, an ID for that or ever any certificate? Because today I wanted, I want this conversation to be a little bit about membership because it's a difficult topic. Last time I was asked uh, by a journalist, I said I would be classed as a participant because in my mind, members are different, participants are different, how we define his met movement is different, how Erdogan defines his met movement and who are his met movement's members are different as well. But let's start with yours. Why do you, uh, how do you met with his met movement and how do you define yourself as a member? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I agree with the expert that you were referring to. I don't identify myself as uh, uh, a member of the Hizmet Movement, but a volunteer for the Hizmet Movement and a participant myself. I am full time with the Hizmet Movement. I have a, uh, I have a role to play in some of the activities of uh, the Hizmet Movement that are being uh, undertaken here in India. So. Um, well, so it's it's uh, about uh, how I define myself. I think I am a volunteer, not a member, because uh, I, I believe uh, that there is no uh, membership in the Hizmet movement. You don't uh, really, uh, it's free exit and free, free entry and free exit in the Hizmet movement. You don't get an ID uh, when you join it as such. Um, if you like the ideas, you join the movement. And when you uh, think uh, you're, there is no, divergence of views, you are free to exit. So that's how uh, I think his movement operates in my understanding. And uh, that is what I am witnessing uh, right now as I, I work here. So uh, going uh, back to the second question that you asked, how I met uh, with the Hizmet movement or how I got introduced to it. Uh, it was uh, uh, the last year of my uh, undergraduate degree at Jamia Millia Islamia University in New Delhi, where I met some of the Abis, you know, the big brothers, uh, as we call in his myth. So I met with them. But yeah, go it gives 1984 <laughs> I mean, elder brothers, yeah. reference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I uh, met with them, and uh, um, it was one person, of course, that I particularly met, and I really appreciated the way he was and the way he treated me. Uh, it was, uh, you know, he was the person who, uh, I, I didn't know anything about the Hizmet movement as such at the time when I met him. Uh, I just liked him. I uh, liked the way he was. And as I said, I liked the way he treated me. Uh, and then I was told uh, that there is a scholarship um, for the Turkish, to learn the Turkish language in Turkey uh, and uh, whether I would be interested in uh, applying for it. So I was uh, really, very interested because during my uh, undergraduate degree, I really got very interested in the um, in the international affairs, especially in the uh, politics of the Middle East. And I wanted to learn a language of the region, uh, so to understand the region better. I so I thought it would be a good opportunity for me to apply for it and uh, uh, to learn the language. So I did that and I was uh, successfully sel selected for uh, the uh, for the course, the Turkish course. 
And as I completed my, uh, I received my degree, uh, I went to Turkey in 2012. Uh, so that after I landed in Turkey, I, you realized uh, less people you know, in I was, Turkey, uh, of course, and it's not as crowded <laughs> as what was the India's population uh, in comparison, so that people understand you're coming from 1.4 billion? Three, three billion, billion to eighty one, million, which yeah, one point three billion to eighty million. Yeah. Yes, so uh, you cannot overemphasize it. One point three billion to eighty million. So of course it was uh, less noisy, more peaceful uh, country. Even Istanbul so probably course, felt like a rural <laughs> work. <laughs> there are trees and people can. Okay, go on. Yeah, so of course, I mean, uh, so I, as I landed in Istanbul, I was, uh, you know, I met some people there, some Indians also who were in the Hizmet movement at the time they received us, they welcomed us. And then we moved to Konya, uh, Konya Mevlani University. We were, uh, I was supposed to uh, study the Turkish language. There's a course called Tomer. So there, um, uh, you know, uh, we we lived in the uh, Hizmet hostel, one of the uh, uh, hostels run by Hizmet volunteers. Now uh, and uh, slowly, this is in Konya. While, uh, even learning the this is in Konya, of course, isn't it? E even wider this and less crowded, you probably felt alone. Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, I did. Uh, of course, Konya, when I first landed, we, I, I saw mountains and uh, it was very cold. It was, it was really, we landed there in October and it was cold in comparison to what it is in uh, Delhi at that time in the month of October. So, yeah, it was uh, cold and uh, less crowded, of course. Uh, but uh, so, so we, we were there and uh, uh, while learning the Turkish language, I learned about the Hizmet movement. I you know, there was especially one person uh, in the uh, in the course uh, who whom I really uh, developed uh, admiration for. Uh, he would come for uh, the speaking uh, part of the Turkish language. So, so he would come and make us speak the Turkish language anyway. So I I uh, I developed some uh, sort of admiration for him and respect. And with him, slowly, I got to uh, know about the Hizmet movement. I read some books by uh, Fatullah Gülen Hoca Efendi, and, uh, uh, and also I got to know more about the movement in general. Uh, I read some articles too. So this is how slowly I developed it. And uh, as I completed my course, the Turkish course, I was offered uh, an internship at Saman newspaper because I was a columnist uh, also before I was writing for some student uh, run magazines in New Delhi. So I wanted, I had that aspiration too, to become a columnist or writer one day. So I applied for the internship at Zaman newspaper and uh, again, that was successfully done. So I went to Istanbul, I lived there uh, for three months. And it was the time when the Gezi Park protests were happening in Istanbul. And, uh, you know, it was a very turbulent time for Turkey. As, as interns at Zaman newspaper, we would also visit. Uh, there were uh, three other friends also from India who uh, were doing internship with me at Zaman newspaper. So we would visit uh, the Gezi Park often uh, to cover. And we also write some articles uh, for the uh, for some newspapers here in in India uh, on Gezi Park protests and what it was, so um, so yeah. And as I completed my internship program at uh, Zaman newspaper, I was then offered a job at Mevlana University to work in the Erasmus office. So then I again uh, came back to uh, Konya and where I worked at the university in the Erasmus office for about two years. In, in so cool. in total, uh, that's how I got to know more about Hizmet movement in the process. I worked at a university. I worked, I lived in a Hizmet hostel. I studied, I read articles about the Hizmet movement and I met people uh, there. So that's how I got to know uh, about it. And with the passage of time, I learned more and more. And today here I am so, sitting in front of you. So that's one of the reasons with this uh, vast background I actually chose as a conversation partner. So I'm, I'm repeating here, you're not a guest now. Hopefully we'll be 
holding these uh, conversations together uh, and we'll have we'll talk about various issues so if I were to summarize that you have actually been on the receiving end of a service let's say you have attended his met courses his met run courses schools universities you have actually participated activities and training in Saman so that, that, that makes you cover two bases, education and media, that his med moment was fair. You have stayed in his med dormitories, so that a different experience. And now you are doing dialogue work, so that's pretty much the, the, the biggest, the, the most vast spectrum of experiences that you have actually participated. But yet, I don't know, in Konya probably you were paid as an employee, employee of the university. It wasn't a volunteer. Is your job at in dialogue, India dialogue, or in together in dialogue? Is it a volunteer job, or are you? Is that you know uh, your employment? Uh, it's it's a volunteer job here at in dialogue. Uh, I um, we, we at, at in dialogue foundation. Everybody who uh, are working are uh, volunteering for it. Uh, in Dialogue Foundation is a non not for profit so, organization. So, so is that why you said as volunteer is met participant rather than a member? What would be the difference? Let's start from there. Like for instance, w w would you believe like this? This no. is the question I came across, isn't it? Someone, uh, I think I can't remember his name now. David, I think David something, asked me for a while. Are you a member of Hizmet Moment? And I said, well, if you look at Erdogan, definitely I am probably a senior member, according to him. Uh, but uh, if you were to see how it is defined, I would say I'm a participant, not a member. And he, he didn't understand. You are either a member or not. But here, uh, as someone who is representing in dialogue form, is telling me that you are a participant volunteer as well. How would you define that? Let's talk a little bit about membership of the movement mm -hmm. so it's not only about uh, the membership in the hizmet movement if we just look at the concept of membership it is about you know you become you register yourself at 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 some place you, you know you there is a supermarket and you want to become a member you get a membership card so you can get some discount in future after you do some shopping there so you uh, you know, you register, you give your uh, your name, you give your email address and you give all these details to them and they give you a membership card and you keep it, you carry it with you. And when you do the shopping and you want to take some benefit uh, of, uh, you want to take some uh, benefit of the membership, you show it, right? You, you have a unique number to show to the, uh, to the shop, to the supermarket and they give you uh, some discount accordingly. But uh, in the Hizmet movement, I haven't come across any such thing. There is no such, there is no system. Of course, when you uh, start working in an organization, in a, in a legal entity like in Dialogue Foundation, you do register. I mean, you have to, there is a process that's the legal requirements of the land where the organization is operating in. But that is about in Dialogue Foundation itself. It's not uh, it's not the Hizmet movement. If there is, I don't know of any CEO of the Hizmet movement. I don't know if Fatula Gulen identifies himself as, as that. I don't think so. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and therefore, it's difficult to say that in Hizmet movement, you become a member. It is, it's, I think it's just impossible. But of course, if it's, it's about dedication, it's about your commitment to the movement, how you feel, uh, how close you feel uh, in the movement, how, uh, how, how much you think you are a part of the movement. And uh, given that such a system doesn't exist in the movement, you simply cannot become a member. You, all you can become a volunteer, a full-time volunteer, a full-time dialogue practitioner, as I identify myself in the Hizmet movement. Uh, but uh, it uh, or or you can be a sympathizer if you're not uh, giving your full time uh, to the activities of the movement or you're just sitting uh, you're doing some other work and uh, sometimes you visit uh, the the hizmet organizations uh, and you participate in some of its activities so uh, if it's only about that, uh, I don't really understand how can somebody call you a member because there's no such system. 
So uh, I, if if I am something of the movement, it is uh, I am a uh, I am a volunteer. I am a participant, and I am a full time participant to give uh, all my time, all my energy uh, into the activities of the Hizmet movement, and uh, uh, and everything else is secondary to me. So, uh, but given such system doesn't exist, I simply cannot call myself a member. It's it's technically not true. Okay, um, that is the uh, difficulty because clearly Erdogan has no problem uh, uh, to call anyone as his met member. Member, you know. So they have a like. That's why I was saying like, who who defines this? For instance, if you were to ask uh, Erdogan or his regime. They have a set of criteria. Even this is accepted by the, let's say, I know, as far as British Home Office goes. For instance, if you are using Bankasia, a state registered bank, that is one one uh, denominator that de defines you might be a member of Hizmet Movement. If you were subscribed to Zaman Daily, if you have been or sending your kids to their schools, Hizmet schools. Uh, if you are participating their social engagements and activities, if you are, uh, I think in one of the cases, uh, if you're using a Bylock app, for instance, and various, various, like I think there was 13 or 16 in however you counted different criteria, that if you have them, mm -hmm. you can be charged in Turkey as a member of Gulen movement. You and I believe that it's not not uh, definitive. It's good that there is something like that because at least people who are claiming asylum abroad can identify because they don't have an ID. That's that's one of the difficulties and it's like when they go and claim asylum for uh, being a member of Gulen movement abroad, uh, it would be very easy to just provide a piece of ID that shows your membership. However, uh, it is more like a in the wider sense, the way I understand it, it's, it's, it's a participation to an idea. But I assumed you would identify yourself as a Hizmet Moment member, because A, you're not only mentally participating the Hizmet Moment uh, ideals and philosophy and the principles, you're also working in one of the institutions. So in my mind, I would class people who work in Hizmet Moment institutions like Zaman Daily universities and stuff and also consider themselves to, to be uh, volunteers not volunteers but let's say participants of the movement I would class them as as members because it is a body uh, and people who are actually uh, what's the word um, maybe giving out um, you know like the way you mentioned Arby's the brothers and sisters within the Hizmet movement who mentor others doing this on voluntary basis, but also within an organizational behavior, within conversation to each other. I would class that as a membership, like around Gulen and institutions, there'll be people who are tied to his movement, movement, uh, not only financially or voluntarily, it may be both ways, but also participating in the understanding of his movement. But you can be also working in Zaman daily, here is the thing, and you may be a art designer there, not necessarily participating or agreeing with the Hizmet movement behaviors. So this doesn't make you, although you work in that, doesn't make you a member. That's, I think, one of the things, isn't it? Uh, there is a lot of institutions abroad, which we're going to cover in the second part, uh, when we're talking about the diversity within the movement institutions or the movement itself. Uh, there is a lot of schools that run by professionals, not necessarily... Uh, know a lot about Hizmet movement itself. They are doing professional work in a Hizmet institution. This doesn't make them either participant or a volunteer or, or anything. It just makes them not even affiliated. You would say affiliated in the sense that they are working a Hizmet affiliated institution. So that's why it's a bit tricky. Maybe we'll come back to that. I don't know. Would you agree with that or would you like to add anything to that topic? Sure. Uh, I mean, for uh, for um, a government uh, as authoritarian uh, as of the the Erdogan regime, of course, for them, if they have to uh, 
make somebody an organization or or an individual uh, a scapegoat uh, they would uh, you know come out with something as fabricated as calling everybody a member or something but but uh, the the fact is uh, the hizmet uh, as far as this uh, had had one not been a member also uh, of the hizmet movement it wouldn't have made any difference for them uh, in terms of what uh, policy they are adopting right now they have they have decided that they want to uh, persecute everybody who is uh, loosely uh, even if loosely or uh, you know, even um, uh, anyhow affiliated with the movement or somebody who even uh, subscribed to the newspaper, they want uh, to punish them, and uh, uh, and and that's that's what they're doing. So it's not uh, it's not only those people who are actively working with the Hizmet organization or identify as Hizmet uh, as Hizmet volunteer or participant or sympathizer. It's not only them, but also those who, in the past ten years ago, lived in a Hizmet hostel, and and that person too, or or subscribed to the Zaman newspaper, or had an account in the bank in in Bank Asia. Even those uh, people have uh, been persecuted. They have been put behind bars, and uh, uh, I don't know. They have been fired from the jobs. So uh, this has happened. So how Erdogan uh, is defining uh, people in the hizmet movement is uh, is is a uh, is a total different debate and of course it's a fabrication whatever they're saying about the hizmet movement or uh, the participants volunteers uh, member uh, quote and quote uh, of the hizmet movement it's 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 total rubbish but what is important is uh, to understand that uh, in Anywhere else, let's say we're not talking about the Hizmet movement, talk about any other organization where you become a member. If that process exists in the Hizmet movement, would have existed in the Hizmet movement, you would have called uh, that uh, that thing a membership in the Hizmet movement too. But but there is no such system at all in the movement, and I don't think uh, therefore it Maybe is right to, is deliberate to uh, keep call. it vague. What do you think? Like, is it is it deliberately to keep it vague? I, I mean, like before, I put you in a in a difficult spot. I I want to say one thing in there. I think, unless we take it as a, as some sort of a philosophy that you adopt, like for instance, since you're from India, let's say, are you a Gandhist? Let's say, right, like Gandhi pacifist, the way he was, and do you have an ID? See, like you may be actually pro Gandhi or a pacifist like Gandhi. You may associate you with yourself with him. And with his movement, if there is a specific movement, probably there is that you can. But it, unless you are a member of the party and this and that, which might be possible as well, but you might be in mind, like, I, I like Gandhi and I would assume myself in comparison to uh, a wider uh, division between him and his opponents, I would consider myself on the side of Gandhi, but I don't have an ID for it because I share his values. And But the fact that the participation. I think there is this key in there also. There was a bit of uh, freedom of speech in Turkey, the problem of freedom of speech. Many people were afraid to identify themselves associated with any religious group, including Gulen. You know, no one would say I am a Nakshi, or, or, although you may actually find it out with his clothing, with his attitude and whatever, people would be afraid because these are all forbidden sects. Even uh, Mevlana uh, you know, his 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 group, uh, Sufi Order of Mevlevis, are constitutionally banned in Turkey. So this that problem as well. But do you do you think that it might be deliberate to just make it vague, or is that because of these issues? I think I think it's uh, also in the nature of social movements. You know, we uh, we know and we understand uh, the Hizmet movement as a social movement, and. Uh, uh, and this is how social movements operate everywhere. Let me give you an example from India. There is uh, this um, very well-known uh, seminary in India, Islamic seminary, Deoband. You, this, it's, this. Uh, it's well known this, in right? Dewsbury as well. Are, oh yeah, that's Tablighi Jamaat, I think. Uh, that's not Deo. Uh, 
in Dewsbury, there is this Tablighi the, the, Jamaat. The center is here of Tablighi okay. Jamaat, but the, the, the strong, one of the Jobandi stronghold is in here as well. They have IMWS in here, I think it's mainly yeah. India Muslim Welfare Society, yeah. so the strongest thing, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So even uh, there, uh, there are they have uh, millions of followers as such. And uh, uh, apart from those who are office bearers, who are uh, you know working full time in in some of the organizations uh, affiliated with the the open the uh, values idea, are uh, having some sort of ID. Apart from that, uh, the other people don't have it. Likewise, if I give you another example from uh, India, uh, it's uh, there is uh, an organization called a social movement, a Hindu, Hindu social movement called Ramakrishna Mission, mm -hmm. RK Mission. And uh, they also started uh, early in the 20th century. And uh, they too have uh, millions of followers uh, across the world, uh, most of them in India. Uh, likewise, they identify as uh, uh, RK Mission volunteers they would uh, they would run at the call of the priest uh, there at the center at the mission uh, but they don't have an id to say so uh, uh, as such so uh, i think it's about the nature of social movements uh, social movements uh, in social movements the the participants the the people who associate themselves with it don't really have an id uh, or or any membership it's it's about uh, whether or not you identify yourself, uh, you, whether or not your ideas match with the uh, ideas of the movement uh, or the leader of the movement. And if you feel so, if you feel, uh, uh, the, if you think there is a divergence of worldview, you come and you uh, dedicate your time, energy, money uh, to the movement. And when you don't, uh, you just stop doing it. And uh, uh, so there, there are, as, as since we were talking about Turkey, there were, uh, of course, a lot of people who were, uh, there are a lot of people who were actually um, giving their time and energy to the Hizmet movement earlier, 10 years ago, and they continue to do so today too. But there are other people also who were uh, giving time and energy to the movement 10 years ago, and then they thought uh, uh, that there are some problems or uh, with the movement, and they stopped doing it. They they start uh, uh, not associating with his myth uh, volunteers and institutions, and still the government is persecuting them just because of uh, what they did 10 or 15 years ago back. Uh, so. So it's uh, it's difficult to uh, say that uh, social movements can ever have uh, member membership. You know, membership is uh, is is something. It's not in the nature of social movements. It's it's simply that, and it's not that Hizmet movement deliberately has chosen to operate that way. It is the way the Hizmet movement is, and if you are a social movement, you really cannot have membership. But uh, but that is one thing that is about the movement, uh, I must say here. Uh, and uh, uh, when it comes to organizations, uh, when you build a school, Hizmet Movement has schools, over 1500 schools across the world, I believe, and uh, more dialogue organizations. So at these institutions, you cannot say that we need not have any membership at the school. You have to register the people who are working at, the, at these institutions uh, you have to uh, have a board who uh, and, and you have to make it transparent that these are the people who work at these institutions and uh, they are uh, you know and they they are doing this uh, they they have this responsibility so this is important hizmet movement since it's a movement you cannot have it there you cannot have a hizmet id but you must have a in dialogue id uh, any dialogue ID, and uh, that's a uh, very important distinction that everybody should make. I mean, so we can't say that we, it's okay not to have membership or not to have uh, uh, an ID uh, at institutions also affiliated with the ID office. But then again, people, let's say, who are affiliated with in dialogue, not necessarily, not necessarily always affiliated with the movement. Maybe they are just coming to be 
to be part of the activity that you are doing. That, that sort of bubble problems emerge. Uh, you mentioned about the schools where I want to take the topic into the second issue, where if you want to take the lead in this one, you can, or you can take the back seat for this program and take the lead next time, because it looks like as if I'm hosting you, but as I said, this is going to be, we're talking to about these topics, but this is an introductory one, so let's be it. Uh, you said, for instance, if someone is working in a Hizmet school, there is 1,500 around the world, more than 1,500 schools. Here is the thing. This brings us the diversity within the Hizmet movement. You are an Indian. Is that right? The, the, the proper Indian, not like the American movies Indian, who are missed, uh, misjudged by... An Indian living in India. Sorry? Yeah. Hmm? An Indian living yeah, in an India. An Indian uh -huh. who is living in India, who has experience in Turkey and England as well. So here is the thing, um, I can give an observation, but uh, one of the problem or one of the issues, not necessarily a problem, but what the nature of the uh, Hizmet movement is that a huge majority of Hizmet movement participants, followers, and, and may mainly core members that would be taken actively part uh, Hizmet movement and employed by the Hizmet movement are actually Turkish people. I had a, I had hosted a Kurdish citizen, a Kurdish journalist before, who complained that there is a degree of uh, difficulty <coughs> for, let's say, Kurdish people to take more initiative within the Hizmet movement. But you're an Indian, not even Kurd, yeah? You're an Indian, and you are uh, uh, taking a leading role in, in Dialogue Forum in India about Hizmet movement. This is, uh, in a way, two-sided issue I want to talk. Before the coup attempt in Turkey and the, the troubles that it brought, how was, how easy, I don't know whether you were interested in the activities at that time, but actively I would assume, yes, you were. How easy to well, take part, participate uh, within his Met movement as an Indian, as a non-Turk, for you, and how was your observation about whether there is any sort of a discrimination against people or uh, not necessarily intended discriminations, but let's say because you wouldn't, you, you're lucky you know Turkish, but many of your colleagues who wouldn't know Turkish wouldn't be able to follow the meeting, so it's not viable, so they are discriminated because of their lack of skills or lack of Turkish uh, mainly. I, I wouldn't necessarily use the word discrimination, but disadvantage maybe. And how was it, let's talk about, before the coup attempt, when the, everything was on track in the Hizmet institution? Was it any difficult, any easy? Did you, did you get any, let's say, uh, advantageous situation? Because you weren't a Turk, you, you were given more respect or reverence. Or disadvantageous position because you wouldn't understand this. You're not Turk. You, you wouldn't know properly. You, you didn't, you know, like... You, you, you you haven't been enough inside the institution. How, how was your experience? I simply uh, cannot say that I was discriminated at any point in time in the Hizmet movement ever since I met with the person, as uh, as I said, when I was uh, still a student, a university student uh, at Jamia Millia Islami, I met a person and I drew admiration for him. And uh, uh, so this is what attracted me I mean, that person became a gateway for me to enter the Hizmet movement and learn more about the organization and the values of the movement. So first of all, of course, I didn't read the, I didn't read the uh, theory of the movement. I saw the person and the way he was and I drew admiration for him. And therefore I thought he must be, since he's a nice person, his friends must also be nice. And therefore I should, it's okay for me. It's nice for me to, to spend some time with him. So, uh, and this is what I saw uh, back then, uh, nine years ago, and this is what uh, I am experiencing even today. So it's very clear for me that I have never been discriminated against uh, uh, at all uh, in the Hizmet movement. Now, Not even um, positively. It was positive discrimination. So, and, and it was because I, um, I, I don't know how good I speak the Turkish language, but I can still communicate with people. I do understand what people are saying. I can read the newspaper. I can follow news. I can read articles in Turkish and I can also speak and I can express myself 
pretty fairly in the Turkish language. So uh, it was, uh, uh, of course, uh, you know, this was this is something that is uh, uh, a great asset in my hand to impress any Turk. You know, everybody becomes very happy to see a non-Turk speaking Turkish, and it perhaps comes uh, uh, from the nationalism, uh, the nationalistic uh, nationalism within the Turkish people. Uh, that they think that see we have been able to uh, teach our language to a non-Turk. Uh, so I mean that too is there, but but of course um, uh, it is an advantage for me. I I think uh, you become more uh, rich, uh, your knowledge become more uh, ri uh, becomes richer uh, when you speak uh, uh, different languages. You have different personalities, and therefore it is very very important for everybody. Uh, to learn as many languages uh, as they can. So uh, because I speak the Turkish language and I uh, I have this keen interest in the Turkish politics too, I know a lot, uh, or if I don't say a lot, but I know, know uh, considerable, considerably about the Turkish politics and its history and its culture. Uh, people uh, take me, uh, you know, it, it becomes easy, easier for them to embrace me. They have, they find it, uh, very endearing, uh, if I can put that way. So, uh, so in the uh, ever since I am in the movement, I have been, if at all there has been any uh, discrimination, it has been positive. And uh, well, and and uh, with regards to uh, the uh, the roles uh, that non-Turks uh, take in the movement, uh, if we talk about that, uh, it's uh, of course I joined or I uh, was introduced to the movement very late in my life. Uh, you know, I was a university student final year when I met them. So it was 2012 uh, when I, I got in introduced to it and slowly I uh, I liked it and I here I am today. Uh, so I, I was given important responsibility before the coup also in Mevlana University when I was teaching. Uh, I was the Erasmus coordinator there. I was I was somebody who, uh, you know, who knew the English language too, and also the Turkish language fairly. So uh, I I I was given the responsibility to interact with the students and uh, uh, give them uh, and and conduct seminars on the uh, Erasmus uh, with them. So I would uh, do all these things, and uh, it was. Uh, uh, because of uh, these skills that I slowly developed in Turkey, uh, I was perhaps also deemed fit to uh, return to India and to run the Hizmet Dialogue Organization in India. So, of course, the other people uh, who were who were in the Hizmet movement here, who were running Hizmet institution in India, they were more experienced than I am. Uh, they 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 had more knowledge and uh, an understanding of the Hizmet values, and uh, um, so slowly, slowly as as the, uh, I spent some time, I did some activities, I engaged in some activities, I developed some activities. I was given more responsibility, bigger role, and now today I am uh, heading the Hizmet uh, Hizmet style of organization in India. Here. So you're responsible so, for. 1.4 billion people and their understanding of <laughs> his movement. That's a, that make that puts you in charge of a quarter of the world population, and their <laughs> their perception on his. Yeah, of course. With, with the limited resources that we have, uh, and we have uh, much limited resources now than we had pre in the uh, I mean before the coup attempt. So uh, with this, uh, we are trying to do uh, our best and, uh, uh, you know, uh, engage in positive activities in this country. Okay. Here are my take on until the coup attempt and what changed, or I can give both and you can, we can share your comment about it. In my opinion, I think I feel, I feel like uh, the Kurdish journalist, uh, I, I think Iskender Sezek, who joined me and who criticized or voiced this uh, criticism that uh, within within the Hizmet movement there is a sense of nationalism, he said, which 
could lead to discriminating even Kurdish members of his net movement. A, or them being speaking Kurdish, but this might be a problem within Turkish politics as well. This can be explained of the learned influences of wider Turkish politics, which is fine. But I feel like, a, especially the language barrier, which you, by learning Turkish we have overcome that. We can actually, we could have talked about this program in Turkish before we started the program. That's good enough for a meeting and everything, so you may have not felt that. But I see his met movement has those principles that can be shared by many different people if they want to. Let's say they say, okay, I, I think <coughs> ignorance, poverty and discrimination, these are big problems and I want to chip in about education. How can I help? And then, then you feel like this sort of like a, you find yourself in a building with some stairs without any, any disabled ramp because it's all designed by Turkish people it's a very short space of time uh, and there isn't enough room to be to engage as a non-Turkish or especially if you're not speaking Turkish in the highest level let's say okay and this was the case like the schools in institution probably your in dialogue was run before you by by a Turkish person and that's not a coincidence. Mm -hmm. Of course, yes. they know better and they can represent. But I, I can observe that, for instance, a British-born, uh, you know, native speaker for both languages, Turkish person, who was educated in Turkey and in a Hizmet school and introduced Hizmet before, can take up to a certain amount of responsibility. But you can see that he cannot go beyond the glass ceiling. This was the issue before 2016. Then after the 2016, the, the diversity in the Hizmet movement has positively exchanged because I think the potential was there. I am not denying that the Hizmet had the potential to be diverse, but not the practice to be diverse. I think for various reasons you may find it. But one of them is, for instance, in Pakistan, in India, in Malaysia, mainly Central Asian countries and the African countries where democracy uh, was not strongest. Uh, his met movement people are, were directly targeted and, and, and harassed, and some of them have been actually abducted, like from Pakistan and different places. I think in more than 14, 15 countries, or 22. I, it's hard to keep the track record because not many people know, but Erdogan is the biggest human uh, abducting, you know, like many people claim the United States is, uh, in terms of illegal abduction of its own enemies. But actually Erdogan now uh, passed that number uh, and abducted so many different people from so many different countries and there isn't a really an international repercussion happened yet. So with this pressure and abduction, uh, I started to observe that many institutions started to become more and more localized, which means like a lot of uh, in, uh, schools in Pakistan, let's say, started to hire more Pakistani teachers, even managers. And different countries uh, ha has this transformation in up to the highest levels. And I think this might have what happened in India as well, because there are various reasons. If there isn't even a pressure, the people who are running those institutions, maybe they are about to, their passport might run out. So they, the, the Turkish consulate refuses to give those services, those citizenship services. So they have to go to a safe country, uh, apply for asylum, because they won't be having a passport soon. That sort of reasons. I think with the coup attempt, Hizmet movement managed to transform into a very, very diverse uh, movement. I don't know what implications will be soon, but uh, I think there'll be a lot of implications. I think it, it will continue up to a level uh, that uh, diversity. You may find yourself, let's say, or you may observe around you that more and more native speakers are taking. Because I think one of the problems, I don't know whether this ha ever happened in India, but one of the problems of not working with local people enough is, for instance, one of the dialogue activity that organized in India might be to have a barbecue <laughs> with, uh, let's say, <laughs> with, let's say, with beef. If that, I don't know, that would be a, a disaster, isn't it? Like in a way, because of the culture in there and everything. Yeah. 
but when you have someone who understands the like yourself who understands indians better because india is a very diverse place you probably you you probably mm-hmm. won't be able to speak all the nat- uh, local dialects let alone understand them there will be so many different nations within india that speaks their own language how many uh, so it is it is in a way a huge potential that you bring to his met moment and his met moon gains a lot by empo- by by being able to employ someone like you even on voluntary basis would you agree with this yeah yeah so um a few points here and i think it uh, really needs to be emphasized uh number one, um you know looking at uh, those uh looking at my predecessor let me give you my example uh looking at my predecessor the at in dialogue foundation the experience that he had in the movement uh, the exp- uh, and the time and uh, uh, energy and the sacrifices he has uh, he ha- has made for the movement uh, for this cause uh, is far more than what i have done you know i have known his met for for the past 9 years and uh, uh, and 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 he knew the his met almost all his life uh, so so looking at uh, at him i don't see myself um, actually i don't i i really i i sometimes even think that i don't deserve to be where i am right now uh, and uh, uh, and 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 it's because and and i'm speaking with you very uh, honestly and frankly here the the level of commitment the level of dedication and the time and energy these people those who uh, th- those whom i have succeeded here have uh, have invested in the movement is uh, far more than uh, than than I, than what i have done so uh, for one to be able a non turk to be able uh, to uh, you know take that uh, role that important role and become really uh, very uh, senior in the movement you also need to have some some experience uh, some uh, you must have shown some uh, level of degree of loyalty to the movement with your dedication work time energy and sacrifices that you make for it so um, so if one is not having that i don't see that there is uh, we can simply say that since we just have to diversify uh, and we have to make the hizmet movement more uh, diverse and therefore we need to induct even those who who are simply not that experienced in the movement so that is one thing it's less in a you know um since me i'm speaking it um it's like a member of the labor party speaking the language of the conservatives you know but uh, i i understand it's uh, but i'm just trying to be objective here uh what i have done for the for the hizmet movement uh, is far less than what my predecessor did and therefore he deserved to be he was and, uh, and 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 looking and and therefore just in the name of diversifying you cannot compromise on uh, things uh, that you have to be uh, have to trust and really have to have someone who can uh, do the same job as uh, the others so that is one thing but of course uh, it is also important uh, to diversify you know this there's no denying this fact and uh, uh, even uh, as from my reading of hoja uh, fnd uh, for like bilen we know that uh, many years ago he would uh, ask people to leave turkey and go out of turkey and i, I think he, he he would talk of uh, 1 million people at least who should go leave turkey and you know work in different parts of the world at the hizmet volunteers he would ask his followers to leave turkey but this uh, didn't really happen it didn't really happen the way hoja uh, fendi wanted it to be uh, and uh, uh, in the aftermath of the coup attempt this happened uh, even though a lot of people didn't really want to leave the country but they now have to leave the country and a lot of them have already left so this i has I, i have to disagree with you it is it is it is still not a million or not even near because um, i recently looked at how many people went through um 
went through Greece uh, over the years. I think it's like 30,000 people. And it, there might be other routes where people go around. So it's still not a big number, despite the... All, no, it's all... not. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. And uh, But uh, I think uh, given the circumstances in Turkey right now, uh, if they have an opportunity, they will leave the country at the first opportunity. So, But but this is not uh, the way Hoja Effendi wanted it to be, right? He wanted it to be voluntary. He wanted, it, uh, wanted people to leave the country and go to different parts of the world. Uh, on uh, with their own uh, intentions and willingness, uh, they uh, so so of course this anyway it didn't happen then and now uh, uh, because of one reason or the other it is happening and uh, uh, and therefore and uh, so so his myth has become more global now than it was before uh, even if. If, even if not not so much, but uh, you know, it it has uh, uh, it it is in a better position in that way in the in the sense of in terms of globalization, it is it it has become more global now than it was before, and uh, because of this um, helpless helplessness, let's say, uh, it is also uh, diversifying. So uh, it is also uh, inducting those who who don't have a Turkish passport and even. Uh, in fact, such people are now preferred in the movement because really the movement uh, needs them. Uh, the, the Turkish passport holders are having uh, troubles across the world. The Turkish embassy and the government uh, is not only uh, you know, undertaking witch hunt in Turkey, but it's also doing it abroad. So those uh, who have other nationalities are preferred. Uh, and uh, this is happening and therefore the movement is becoming more diverse. So now uh, there are two things. Number one uh, here, it is one for the uh, the non-Turks or those who have not been inducted or ha have not been uh, given bigger role or bigger responsibility in the movement. It's for them to really uh, do their job as it is expected and to, uh, you know, uh, and 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 uh, embrace the movement and uh, you know live up to the expectation. But on the other hand, it is also for uh, the for for the Hizmet movement and uh, the Bu uh, Kabiler. It is also uh, a, a time to understand that uh, this is the diversity that is now there in the movement is was uh, expected was uh, uh, was something that uh, should have been there before but it has uh, uh, it is slowly mm -hmm. happening now and and therefore we need to uh, enforce, reinforce it we need to uh, you know work more on it so it it continues on this path let's well, not after some time when the situation in turkey is good, let's not reverse this but uh, uh, you know consolidate this Good luck, good luck with that, working on that. But observation-wise, it seems like you have already found two reasons to uh, appreciate what he did. I can't say thank Erdogan, because one is he said he, Gulen was asking his, uh, his followers to, to go out from Turkey to serve humanity. A million people should leave to serve, he said, which he said it wasn't practiced which which i i agree with you totally and i talk about it often uh, with this crisis in turkey many people left not many but you also wishfully thinking i think that many people would leave if they were to have uh, passports or the or the means which in my opinion observation is otherwise not really many many people wouldn't leave in fact many of the people who left turkey would go back it's a strange strange uh, story uh, and the second reason, uh, uh, in a way, this crisis caused his met movement to embrace the diversity that was in there as a potential. That's why I'm not, I'm not necessarily, my criticism is at, at the limit of where I say, okay, his met movement wasn't diverse and he had, had an inherent uh, racism or creating that, uh, some sort of a disadvantaged situation for non-Turkish speaker or even non-Turks in general. Or even if people are not properly educated in Turkey and properly understand everything, because it's a disadvantage as well, as you 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 have 
been introduced to this quite late, so you have a disadvantage uh, time-wise, which you can't catch up with the people every time they'll be they'll be there before you. So, but this shouldn't come in place. But potentially, we can see that it was there potentially at least that it was overcome very quickly. There wasn't a big of big big uh, fight against it, or there isn't a big resistance, as you said. Uh, do, do, uh, in, in the coming years, we may see non-Turkish passport holders would be more valuable, more, um, more helpful to his met movement because they are not an apparent, under apparent threat of Erdogan regime if this, if this uh, struggle goes on. That brings us to 60 minutes. I'm hoping that next programs will be sticking to like uh, 50 minutes and maybe talk about a couple of uh, comments. But just to allow one of the comments, I want to just uh, put one of them on the screen. I think it sums up uh, some of the topics very nicely. I don't know why it is not. Okay. It's not this one. That's strange. Sorry, I can't, I can't reflect somehow the comment. Uh, I don't know why. I'll bring back the title. I'll fix that and, and do that next time. Um, and hopefully this will be a, a regular program. Uh, Besat Fatimi, thank you very much for uh, joining me in this Hizmet Talks, uh, which we are hoping to hold it in a regular uh, way. And then hopefully that you will be hosting, co-hosting this, not being a, a, an interviewee like we have done. Anything you want to say with your audience? Apart from, of course, please join uh, Behzad's uh, YouTube channel. I'm going to put it on the screen again, if you can see it. I would like this number to change quickly. So let's say 545 and see how many people have already found. Still same. It is strange. There is hundred more than 100 people uh, watch this. And uh, hopefully the, the, the people people who don't know you enough can follow various publications you have written in various places and see what you are interested more about and then uh, and I will see you next time again. Sure, uh, thank you so much for having me uh, Dr. Ismail Siskin. It was a pleasure uh, being in conversation with you. Um, I all I can say to my um, or to our uh, audience today is, uh, of course, from following uh, this uh, YouTube channel. Uh, also, uh, do subscribe uh, to the YouTube channel that I uh, have that I run, uh, where I uh, publish uh, videos in Hindi or Urdu language on the Hizmet and the Turkish politics. Thank you very much. I think that is one of the unique. Uh... Uh, things because of this mass propaganda that Erdogan does. I, because of my con connection with the Urdu speakers in, in this country, I know there is a branch that works heavily on Urdu speaking people to create all sorts of uh, propaganda. And you are the only source I know that I can actually forward it to, to them to at least have something, uh, let's say, more yeah. better thought and not a piece of propaganda. Thank you very much, Besat. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I know it is very late in India. It might be like almost midnight. And hope to see you next time. Thank you so much for having me.